Thank you so much. It's, it's amazing to be in this incredible space. Welcome, everybody. Thank you all for being here on this Friday evening um, for the second conversation, which is part of the Body Doubles Symposium. I'm very happy to be in conversation with Wojtek Blahash this evening. Um, our talk is, I think, titled Finding Transcendence. So we'll see what we find. Um, that was a terrible joke, I'm sorry. I get the microphone and bad things happen. Um, and Annie, I just want to thank you for putting together this incredible symposium. Would you like to say anything by way of introduction? Say something. Say something. Hi. Ooh. Uh, thank you so much for coming and being here. And thank you, Amy and Vortec and Alexandra and Molly for uh, saying yes to this crazy adventure. Um, so this is the last day of um, the, the actual symposium. Um, and I think so far we've engaged in a lot of really interesting um, conversations surrounding sound practice and accessibilities and how do we use body um, to make music, to sense music, to engage with sound materials. So everybody's practice is so different and varied and I think for me, this is all beneficial for, for myself in terms of like thinking through these problems in my own work. So thank you again for being here. Um, I think some of you are probably also coming to Body Opera, which is um, the first performance is tonight and there's a repeated performance tomorrow. Uh, if you got a ticket, excellent. If you don't, um, there might be opportunity for a wait list. So I uh, hope to see you there, but thank you for being here. Thank you, Annie. Um, so Wojtek and I will be in conversation for the first part of the session, and then maybe around 6.40, we will open up for collective conversations and questions. So you know, do brew up interesting comments and questions, because we will have collective conversation a little, little bit. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce Wojtek. Um, composer Wojtek Blechasz was born in Gdynia, Poland, in 1981. And in 2006, he graduated with honors from the Frederick Chopin Music Academy in Warsaw with a Master of Arts. And in 2015, received the PhD in music composition at University of California, San Diego. He's been living in Berlin since 2015. Between 2012 and 2019, Blahash has been curating the Installations Music Festival at Warsaw's Nove Theater featuring non-concert music, sound installations, performance installations, sound sculptures, music videos, music theater, and others. Blehash has directed three of his opera installations, Transcriptum in 2013, commissioned by the Grand Theater National Opera in Warsaw, Park Opera in 2016, commissioned by Theater Povshekna in Warsaw, and Body Opera, commissioned by Huddersfield Contemporary Music Festival in 2016. In 2018, he composed the opera Fiasco, commissioned by the Staatstheater Darmstadt. In 2019, Recknitz, opera for six actors and four cellos, based on Elfrida Jelinek's text, commissioned by the Warsaw Autumn Festival and TR Warsaw. Blechash's music often redefines the traditional concert format and proposes different relations between the listener, viewer, and the sound. His music involves site-specific projects, participatory audience, elements of music, and instrumental theater, as well as immersion and embodiment of sound. His performative music installations and music theater pieces include Sound Work for Eight Actors, commissioned by T.R. Warsaw in 2016, House of Sound for 40 Instruments and Participatory Audience, commissioned by Swawatsky Theater Krakow in 2017, Manifesto for Orchestra for Any Type of Instrument and Participatory Audience, commissioned by Eclecto Geneva in 2019, A Cycle of Eight Fields for Various Instrumental Spatial Setups, Symphony No. 1 for Orchestra in Four Groups and Moving Audience, commissioned by the Stettin Philharmonic in 2019, Symphony No. 2 for Orchestra Open to Any Type of Musician, commissioned by Theater and TG, TD Zagreb in 2019, Symphony No. 3 for 200 Wireless Speakers, commissioned by Dono Eschigen Music Taga in 2021 and 2023. 
quite an impressive list. <laughs> so welcome, Wojtek. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for okay. having me. All right. So to, um, to start off our conversation, I would love to just invite you to speak a little bit about your practice of opera installation. I just absolutely love that intersection. It's so conceptually and historically and sort of politically rich. And I was hoping that you could sort of talk us through sort of how you've come to that practice and the kind of work that you see it doing um, creatively for you and maybe in a broader sense as well. I will try to speak as slowly and clearly as possible, so please bear with my Eastern European accent. And um, opera in general is, can be quite problematic, right? Yes. It's very exclusive. Mm -hmm. uh, mm, it's very mm, wide also in a way, and uh, it imprisons our bodies in a very specific way. And this is what uh, what became a libretto for the opera that will be presented tonight. But maybe I'll start from the from the very beginning. Um, what I what, it all started in 2013 when I received a commission from the Grand Theatre National Opera in Warsaw, and I had to uh, you know challenge myself with this uh, with this historical historical genre and. Uh, and I realized very quickly that the last thing I would like to do is to set text to music, which is in a way the heart of the opera. And, but what, what fascinates me in this genre is its interdisciplinary queer spirit. And um, an opera from the very beginning, uh, I mean, in the 18th century, opera was regarded to be like the highest form of European art because um, by combining different fields of arts, opera was able to create new types of expressivities. Mm -hmm. And um, one, of the, one of the most important tools for, for European opera in, 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 in the 18th century was creating this half-sang, half-spoken uh, style of presenting text, which was called a recitativo, still a recitativo, a recitative. And, um, and that was an amazing tool to use at that time, and opera was regarded to be mm, mm -hmm. even higher than the spoken drama, mm -hmm. and so on and so on. But I find it, you know, highly artificial these days mm -hmm. when 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 the text is set to music and it just doesn't resonate in me and doesn't speak to me. So I decided to search for different tools um, to to redefine opera. I, I believe that you know. Setting text to music was very well appropriated by pop mm -hmm. music. Mm -hmm. I, I was mm -hmm. mentioning it uh, today by yes. you know, Beyonce or Taylor Swift are doing an amazing job, you know, making music with lyrics. So why should I make some like strange music with which is sang on stage? It, it, I just I just don't buy it. It doesn't speak to me. But in Italian, mm -hmm. opera means work. So mm -hmm. I play around with the term of this, um, with the meaning of this term, and I see opera as work with sound, work about sound, work, work mm -hmm. through sound in a very mm -hmm. conceptual way, more related to sound art or conceptual art. And, um, and, installate, and then I, I, I was thinking, right, like what is the most relevant field of art for me, for a person born in 1981, mm -hmm. different than text, Mm, and uh, I realized that it, it must be installation art, mm -hmm. right? Because installation mm -hmm. art opens my uh, opens my uh, my uh, I mean opens uh, creates a different relationship between me and the space mm -hmm. and the time mm -hmm. and the object in space and so on and so on. So it also liberates my body in the process of experiencing mm -hmm. the the piece of art, and this is what I this is what I enjoy and this mm -hmm. is what I would like mm -hmm. to do. So so opera, which is work on sound that mm -hmm. has to be installed um, in a specific space. Mm -hmm. And it, very often it involves participatory audience yes. and, mm -hmm. uh, and it's open for collaboration mm -hmm. also with other artists. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when I was doing my first opera, I did not invite a librettist to work mm -hmm. with. I invited a sculptor and mm -hmm. a, mm, a, a light designer. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that is for me what I understand as interdisciplinary because I believe that interdisciplinary doesn't mean to fill old forms with new sounds, but to redefine those mm -hmm. forms mm -hmm. and to try to test the boundaries of those of yes. those forms as well. Mm -hmm. This is my heritage, right? Like I was trained as a classically trained composer, so opera or symphony or concerto, mm -hmm. these are my, my 
my, my forms, mm -hmm. but I find them very stiff and very normative and also very oppressive in a way, mm -hmm. you know, um, because I you know we are told uh, from, from the very beginning that listening to Wagner's four hour operas is good and it's, mm -hmm. uh, and it's beautiful and it has to be, like we are cultivating the same ways mm -hmm. of presenting sound for centuries without mm -hmm. reflecting on it, without, um, without thinking about our bodies. How we how they are you know, trapped very often for long periods periods of time. So this is how it all started slowly, step yes. by step, to yes. to okay. to search for new okay. corners oh, and peripheries. Uh, yeah, thank thank you so much. That's like that is so fascinating. I mean, I could not agree with you more. That quote, opera is quote unquote problematic. Um, it's such a complex, like mess, messy history. Um, opera has historically been a site for political power brokerage and a fascinating place where desire gets staged, right? But also where certain musical conventions get coded onto certain bodies and certain modes of desire. Um, so it's very ambivalent and rich and messy in that sense. It's also a place historically where various social classes have gotten to interact where those spaces were not sort of possible across the social field. And I think that seems like something that your opera installations also sort of take up in interesting ways. And I'm wondering if you can maybe speak a little bit about the two projects that precede body opera and sort of how you're dealing with questions of audience engagement and interaction and movement as the driver of um, dramatic development and narrative, and I know in some cases like really deep conceptual approaches to fragmentation. Um, so can you maybe talk us through um, those those two projects, so Transcriptum and then also Park Opera, and um, maybe lead us to um, some nice framing for body opera before this evening. Mm -hmm. Maybe I would start with this, that uh, the, the history of the opera itself is very interesting mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. um, it has lost a lot of its initial charm in a way mm -hmm. and participatory spirit as yes. well. Like operas back in the 18th century were like highly social yes. and they were yes. more like social gatherings mm -hmm. and not like very exclusive, uh, you know, um, meetings in, in the temples of sound where, mm -hmm. you know, for the where tickets cost a small fortune and so on and so on. Yes. People, would, people would go to the opera house and they would just get gossip, you know. They would rarely talk list, the whole talk, time, the, the play whole cards, time. get drunk. <laughs> exactly. Yes. They would. They would. They. they, they um, there is even a reference to that actually in body opera. Uh, there is oh, a nice. part called mm -hmm. Can Candy Aria, and uh, it's related to so-called sherbet op uh, arias. Yes. Yes. So a sherbet aria would usually open the second act, and it's called. It was called a sherbet aria because between the first and the second act, a dinner would be served. And when the second act would start, you know, they would serve desserts, usually uh, uh, um, sorbets, sherbets. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so there was lots of noise coming from the spoons and the, you know, and the yes. dishes. So, mm -hmm. so the opening aria in the second act would always be designed for the secondary character, for the servant, you know. Mm -hmm. So because people w were yes. still busy with, with eating. And um, so I wanted to, to kind of like to, rec to, to recreate mm -hmm. the spirit and to make an opera a social gathering and also a space where the audience actually can, can participate in building the opera. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Park Opera yes. happened in, um, sorry, my presentation is very messy, so I won't be showing too many examples okay. not to stress no. Bill and uh, ask, I promise I will not ask him to go back and forth. Um, park Opera takes place in one of the parks in Warsaw and um, and it has nine acts, and these acts are typical elements that belong to the operatic genre, but they are transformed into the situation in the park. So, um, for example, there is a ballet, right? Every mm -hmm. operatic production requires a proper ballet, and in park opera, a ballet is a, it's a social project dedicated mm -hmm. to the local joggers and runners, to people mm -hmm. who do sports in the park. And they were invited to this project and every, everybody got a simple costume and every person got two wireless speakers. So they, mm -hmm. they had, we had like 20 runners and they would run with those wireless speakers through the park and each speaker had like a, you know, a, a music inside of it. So they were creating this cloud of, running cloud mm -hmm. of sound mm -hmm. and, and interacting with people in a very surprising way sometimes. <clears throat> so, um, 
There is a there is there was a, a moment where one of the acts of the opera was dedicated to the children. So there was mm -hmm. a a walk with an ornithologist. There was an art workshop, and out of this art, art workshop, uh, children would have to paint imaginary birds based on po poems written by local poets. And then at the end, they would have to create sounds for those imaginary birds. And then at the end, you would get the final product, which was the the the, the book with the illustrations with the of the children and the poems. And there was a sound installation hidden in the bushes with all the sounds oh. created by the by the children. Amazing. But at the end, this is dedicated to the to us, you know, to to adults, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because we have to walk between the bushes and we have to listen to those sounds, to those onomatopoeic sounds, mm -hmm. because in in the society we we don't talk about sound and very often I hear from my friends you know I don't know how to name this sound right. you know I'm mm -hmm. not a musician mm -hmm. I, do, I don't know how to yeah. uh, how to talk about music so so this booklet with the with the with the with the text and and the poems and the types of sounds was supposed to stimulate your imagination mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. wait is this sound rough or maybe silverish is it you know is this sound high or low and so on and, mm -hmm. and so on and so on mm -hmm. to activate activate listening right mm -hmm. Body opera is, uh, park opera is in a way about your our connection to the nature, how we mm -hmm. listen to each mm -hmm. other, how we deep listen to the surroundings. You know, mm -hmm. Paulina Oliveros would say that um, animals are the best deep listeners because they have mm -hmm. to constantly scan mm -hmm. the environment and, and, and listen for the survival, basically, mm -hmm. or for... Mm -hmm. <coughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So... So, um, so park opera was like fully mm -hmm. participatory and, and, it, uh, and it was, it was done... Uh, I think twelve times uh, in in uh, within three years, and and every time it was uh, really lovely to see you know people mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. um, at the opening night we had like five hundred people coming. They, I told you they wow, ate the yes. stage set <laughs> for the mm -hmm. for for the. There is one every like really really big opera production needs like livestock, live live animals on stage. Right. Every respectable opera, so. So, um, but in you know in park opera we have all the all all the uh, all the animals uh, living in the park. So uh -huh. so I invited the unicorns, mm -hmm. um, and um, but the humans they have lost the ability to to see the unicorns. Mm -hmm. But there is a trick how to sense their presence. So there was a huge circle of hay. And at the rim of this hay, there were apples and rose petals because this is what they feed, this is what they eat. Mm -hmm. And you would arrive and you would get a, mm, a audio guide. And I invited a Polish equivalent of David Attenborough actually oh, to wow. read that story. <laughs> <laughs> so she says that, you know, it's a hot uh, July afternoon and this is the time when the unicorns come to feed on the rose petals. Wow. And that we lost the ability of, the, of, of seeing them, but, but we can sense their presence. Mm -hmm. So... Please, you know, go on the on the hay and lay down on the hay and wait for, and you can sense their presence. And what is underground? I put around twelve vibrating speakers underground, oh, like wow. directly underground. So, so when you lay down on that hay, you can feel <laughs> like this oh this this God. vibration wow. that um, that is, you know, and it's fun, and of course, mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. at the end, one second, it's all about a simple fact. Sound is a vibration. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. physical energy that yeah. is embodied, I and it also this. kind kind of takes us to 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 this. So there was a lot of you know fun to um, in wow. uh, while making. Mm -hmm. There is nothing better than working in the park. You know, waking mm -hmm. up in the morning and uh, instead of theater, and just yeah. going to the park and uh, looking at the birds and um, yeah. I remember one very funny anecdote on the dress. There was like a proper dress rehearsal, like it, you know, that the, the, the way how it happens in the in the institutional theater. And um, I did not. I forgot that actually one uh, the the choir was actually happening in the section of the park, which is a cruising area, like a really uh -huh. old time mm -hmm. <laughs> cruising area. And the director of the theater was like cruising mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. the uh, through that mm -hmm. area, and, and he was picked up by some guys. <laughs> <laughs> And he was just a theater director, like uh, approving the the you know the dress <laughs> rehearsal. <laughs> uh, so yeah, different mm -hmm. adventures. Um, wow. And in 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 the first uh, first mm -hmm. opera in transcriptum, I um, maybe here I would mess around a little bit, and I, I'll okay. just show you yeah. the building because it gives some some sort of scale. Uh, uh, so I can show you at least. That was the, the one of the par, uh, elements of, of park opera. This is the recitative for, for toy piano. This is the aria. Um, the, mer the mermaid is the symbol of Warsaw. So people would sit here on those, 
lounge chairs and they there you see the headsets with long cables that go into the water we dropped a bottle with uh, co2 in the in the lake so it was bubbling like mm -hmm. something was sitting oh, inside wow. and uh, when you would sit an mm -hmm. asher would come with a tray with raspberry candies because mm -hmm. aria is usually something sweet so you mm -hmm. we combine mm -hmm. flavor with uh, taste with I invited some uh, graffiti artists to make the stage set. This, uh, this graffiti says, I'm all ears. This is the map, how it looked like. The, we had an, uh, like, uh, a brass sextet playing on one side of the lake, so you mm -hmm. could hear, listen mm -hmm. to them on the other side. The ballet was running all over the place. <clears throat> yeah, this is, this, is the, this is where I'm aiming. Okay, great. Oh, here. This is the Grand Theater National Opera in Warsaw, and as you can see, it's a, it's a big, it's a huge building, and um, mm, you can put the you can put the the La Scala Opera Theater in Italy here, just on the stage of the on, on the stage of this building. It was rebuilt after the war, you know, in this like Soviet uh, socialist uh, style gigantic there is almost 1200 people working in this building and <clears throat> and this building um, became the, like the main inspiration for my for my work and also when i when i started directing mm -hmm. i'm not mm -hmm. a like you know a theater director but i know how to direct sound in space and time and i was completely mesmerized by those endless you know mazes of halls corridors mm -hmm. cargo elevators and i wanted to make an opera about psychological trauma Mm. What fascinates mm -hmm. me in it, mm -hmm. I, uh, to be specific, I wanted to place the viewer in the structure of the psychological trauma, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. always alien or chaotic, you know, dark. Mm -hmm. There are those theories that, that say that um, trauma is so extreme that when it happens to us, it goes outside of our understanding, outside of our memory, and it hides into this, you know, dark void that dark container outside of our um, understanding, and then it oozes back through flashbacks, repressed memories, um, mm -hmm. chunks mm -hmm. of, and bits of, of, of uh, events. And I found it very fascinating, fascinating, and I wanted to kind of like to recreate this type of structure into place and to place the viewer inside of it. Mm -hmm. So here I was working with 250 people. I divided them in five groups. And they were, there were five trails and five main spaces in the, in the building of the off-stage spaces of the opera. We didn't use the stage at all, only, only at, the, in the, at the end. And uh, those five spaces of the opera house, they represent five uh, phases of grief. So there's depression, anger, bargaining, um, denial, and acceptance. And in each of those spaces, there was a different uh, fragment of music, and um, and at the end also I wrote a small story um, about the protagonist of this opera. It was a woman, and something very tragic happened in her life. She she basically she experienced a fire of her house, and and uh, and her husband died in this fire, but her child survived. And there is something. There is a mystery which happens after that. And the audience is walking through those endless halls and trying like to put encounters on their way, like different installations, different objects, diff okay. different situations, okay. actors, actresses, to be specific, because all female characters are dressed in the same way, like they will mm -hmm. they would multiply the the protagonist, mm -hmm. and they are trying to you know collect tho those bits of information. And the confusion is also an important mm -hmm. um, element in this okay. narrative, because confusion okay. is also a very important element in like, you know, recalling the trauma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and also the architecture. So the architecture um, works as the memory itself, mm -hmm. right? We are lost mm -hmm. in the inside of the memory and the architecture is the, is the memory. And also the sound is the carrier of the, of the memories because there is a fragment for two accordions uh, in, in the opera, which is very loud, so mm -hmm. we can very often hear it. You know, it, they play on the fifth floor, but we can hear hear the accordions on the second floor, on the seventh floor. So we are like haunted by this, mm -hmm. uh, by this sound, mm -hmm. by this memory constantly. It it returns, like a returning dream, mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. uh, you could see there was this neon installation, returning dreams. This is yeah. one of the light mm -hmm. installations. Mm -hmm. I was not myself. This is one of the most crucial sentences mm -hmm. that many mm -hmm. patients, traumatized people, say that you know when trauma was happening today, they were they were not themselves. They, they didn't know what was happening. Mm -hmm. And this is returning 
dreams and you have this, when you pass through this corridor, you have this feeling like you would emerge, uh, uh, submerge under, under, under water in smoke. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, thank you so much. Is, is this an okay place to pause? Yeah, I think. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, thank you so much for talking us through like these, these sort of two incredible pieces that are both, they're thematically very different, mm -hmm. but they both put the, the audience in a space of kind of creating narrative or stringing together narrative through movement and through interaction and through participation, um, which it's, it's so interesting that one of the pieces brings us into the sort of deep interior psychic life of the fragmentary and chaotic processing of trauma. And then park opera, like it sort of turns opera inside out and like explodes it and engages with its fraught history in such an imaginative and sort of playful fashion. It's just like such a joy to hear you sort of unfold that. Um, and I think, well, one of the first pieces of text that people who come to body opera tonight will encounter is the sentence, this opera is dedicated to your body, which is so beautiful and it's such an extension of sort of care and reciprocity um, and empathy. And these are themes that have come to the surface in many conversations during the symposium. Um, and I just wanna ask in a general sense, like what does, it, what does that mean to you? Like what does it mean to dedicate the opera to your, the kind of performative you, to your body and how, do you imagine that the audience might take up that dedication? Mm -hmm. The research on body opera took about two years, mm -hmm. and the first version was supposed to look completely different. But uh, I thought it was about to, to, uh, it was going to be about a dancer. Mm -hmm. Never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> after after completing my PhD, I, I had a great honor to co-teach a class at the psychology department in mm -hmm. San Diego with Professor mm -hmm. Piotr Winkelmann, who is an expert in embodied perception. And uh, we, we were teaching a class to psychology students about new music mm -hmm. and how and, 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 and embodied perception. So it inspired me exactly to go away from the dancer and mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to uh, I remember that moment when I realized I was so lost. I had so much material, nothing was clicking. Mm -hmm. It was all trash, you know, oh. like really a year and a half of mm -hmm. research, the whole structure was ready, the festival was coming. And then one mm -hmm. day I was like, no, this is all about the, the audience. Ah, okay. Uh, it's yeah. all about your bodies, not about some abstract bodies of, mm -hmm. or, you know, mm -hmm. or, or different. Um, yeah. And that was also the moment when I when I moved to from San Diego to Berlin, mm -hmm. and I I went to my first rave. And mm -hmm. as a classically trained musician, it was a you know a quite a shocking experience in a positive way, mm -hmm. because for the first time in my life, I felt like I was wrapped in sound, mm -hmm. you know, and. Uh, Sound is the biggest love of my life, so it was so beautiful for, for me to to feel it. And um, I thought that is there, uh, you know, maybe there is a way like to recreate this uh, this sensation of embodied sound through some like very simple analog way. You know, mm -hmm. how can we insert sound inside of our bodies? And um, and uh, this is now I can go back to the okay, first picture. Okay. <laughs> mm. But also, if in general, like body body opera can be understood as a critique of of a mm -hmm. of a music institution, mm -hmm. right? We said we said that the that the um, opera houses they in, they imprison our bodies, or we we, we, we we are we are told that those normative ways of experiencing sound are right for us, and. Um, and um, for me also as a queer person, you know, I was mm -hmm. always like, you know, trying to go like against uh, um, those, those op different forms of, you know, subtle oppressions uh, in, in the society and so on and so on and reclaim our senses also mm -hmm. in a way, right? Because mm -hmm. our senses are very often uh, imprisoned. So, so the main gesture of the body opera is that there is no seats. Look at you, you're tired already, it's Friday, 5 p.m., you want to go home, 6.30. So, so body <laughs> opera is for, for 100 yoga mats, maximum 100 yoga mats, right? So you come to the opera house and you can lay down. 
because we are tired, mm -hmm. right? Nice. And the overture for body opera is a lullaby because first we need to take a nap mm -hmm. to be able to, to look at art. And, um, and uh, the first version of body opera was a little bit bigger and with also with mm -hmm. three performers. Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, after, you know, it was, it was done in England, in, in Finland, in Luxembourg, in Warsaw. And mm -hmm. after this tour, I realized, okay, uh, let's get rid of all this like performative aspect. Mm -hmm. We don't mm -hmm. need, you know, like giant um, sound sculptures. There was a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's just limit this experience for, to the pillows and let's keep it sim simple. Mm -hmm. Sometimes less yeah. is more. So, so you have 100 yoga mats and you have those pillows, right? They look quite innocent, but there is actually a <laughs> vibrating speaker inside of this pillow. So at some point you start to, to realize that, this, that, you know, that um, there is something happening. Mm -hmm. and, and you start to build relationship between your body, your ears, your bones, your muscles and the pillow. And you know, the more you press your head against the pillow, the deeper the sound gets inside of you. And so this is the... Mm -hmm, this mm -hmm, you know yeah. like re reenactment or recreation of this mm -hmm. of this uh, embodied sound yeah, um, um, but not only i don't know if you are coming tonight so i don't want mm -hmm. to give you uh, too many spoilers uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so maybe i'll just leave it here okay well can i can i ask a quick follow up um, i actually want to pick up on something so beautiful that you said um, during the class this afternoon, you said there's so much wisdom in rave culture. And of course, like we know, we know that to be true. Like, like dance subcultures have been spaces of profound survival and resistance and world building for queer communities and communities of color and for like just a very like thick and beautiful social fabric. And I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about about what that wisdom means for you and how that wisdom like lives and how it lives in your work and how it lives in this piece. So maybe we can also explain the title of this meeting, which is a reference to an article at the New York Times. Oh yeah, I was like going to talk like about a, that too, okay. but you can talk about it. No, no, no. You go. Um, uh, yeah, I said that, that I, I think, it, for example, you know, when I started raving, I stopped playing instruments mm -hmm. and I felt bad about it. But then I, re I realized that my sound practice is actually, you know, my every Sunday dance, right? And this is mm -hmm. how I, this is like a new way for me to express sound. And I, I still go to the Philharmonie or to the Opera House mm -hmm. from time to time mm -hmm. just to test uh, this on myself and to see how it works. And sometimes it's, I still like the, the format of a concert. There is something beautiful, beautiful about it. But in most of the cases, I'm sitting there and like, my God, <laughs> this chair is so uncomfortable. <laughs> okay. I'm dehydrated and I want to just stretch, you know, and stand up. So, um, rave is like a concert. We can see mm -hmm. it as a concert, mm -hmm. right? So we mm -hmm. come to the concert and we are fully immersed in sound and we, we have full freedom to express that sound. We can do anything we want. We can dance, we can wave our hands, we can walk, we can talk, you know, we can do so many things. We can... Mm -hmm. And uh, this, is, this is such a simple uh, fact and yet uh, it works. Um, so why couldn't we, I mean, there are, of course, it's a rhetorical question, but still, we, why there is so little experimentation in, for example, letting audience move when the orchestra mm -hmm. plays, you know, Tchaikovsky's symphony or something, or mm -hmm. at least to lay down on the mats and to, 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 to listen to this music uh, uh, differently. And, um, and uh, also there is, uh, there is so much devotion to sound and music mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. the rave culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, it's connected to, to many elements uh, from mm -hmm. your look to, you know, to, to the f sometimes mm -hmm. very radical philosophy of life. Yes. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I like this, this type of radical devotion to music. It's, mm -hmm. I find so much beauty that people are mm -hmm. so in love yeah. with music and mm -hmm. sound that, you know, mm -hmm. that they dedicate their entire life to. Mm -hmm. To um, yeah, to that love. Yeah, it's so it's just it's so moving to hear you say like, sound is the love of my life, and to yeah. really think like, well, what does that like? I mean, what does that mean, and how does that connect you with people? How does that connect you with your body? How does that sort of open you to all sorts of forms of reciprocity? It's mm -hmm. just such a it's. There's no question in here. This is one of those yeah. classic like comment, not a question moments. Um, but it really it's such a profound provocation, and it's like it's very generous of you um, to sort of bring us into you know the space of how you experience that. 
but I also like to follow up the politics of care. This it also yeah. became a very important element for my work at some mm -hmm. point. You know, like mm -hmm. to under, especially when you come from like European, you know, classical music training, which is so restrictive and very of patriarchal, you know, and based on becoming a virtuoso. We don't need that, right? We need care. Right. And also, like right. I will, when I was mm -hmm. uh, when I was. Um, this year I had a premiere of my piano concerto, which is uh, for mm -hmm. piano and 50 wireless speakers. I am, I am the conductor in this, in this piece. So the orchestra is replaced by electronic devices, mm -hmm. by wireless speakers, which is also kind of like a critique of, of an orchestra, because it's really fucking difficult to work with, uh, with, with mm -hmm. orchestra, uh, orchestra musicians. I had a... <laughs> yes. Although I have to, I, I had a, a, last year in February, exactly one year ago, I had a premiere of my larger, largest orchestral piece. It was a, a 60 minute um, piece for orchestra in 10 groups on three floors with walking audience as well. Mm -hmm. The first, it would cost me so much stress, not to mention that it was, oh, never mind. Um, but at the us. end, it, at the end, it was a good. It was uh, on, on on both sides. I was working directly with the assistant of the protagonist of the movie Tar. I don't know if you know uh, aware of that. So yes. there's certain type of heritage in this uh, <laughs> relationship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, anyway, so uh, at the end, it was a positive experience to work with orchestral mm -hmm, musicians. But mm -hmm. the piano, concerto for piano and wireless speakers. This is, you know, you don't want to work with us. No problem. You know, we can just uh, switch you. Uh, to wireless mm -hmm. speakers, and you know, the only thing I have to do I, is to charge you and to it, and then to change the memory card from time to time if I want to change music. But the role of the conductor is I like against this patriarchal figure mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. has to dominate and boss around. I bring those speakers with care to space as well, mm -hmm. one by mm -hmm. one. Like I would be planting a sound garden, and I'm offering also. Uh, mm, ASMR treatments to the audience during the during the show. I approach oh, people very gently, and mm -hmm. I have two speakers in my hands, and I mm -hmm. and I give you a little bit of a massage, you know, mm -hmm. a sound massage, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. because I, I I believe that we needed much more than just another masterpiece and mm -hmm. uh, and another conquering of whatever whatever. Um, I watched a few excerpts from uh, the the project Queer Magic Intervention, and there are these just incredible moments where people are seated. I, I gotta keep the microphone in front of my mouth, sorry. Um, I talk with my hands, if I can't move <laughs> with my hands, the ideas don't, the, the ideas don't come out. Um, but there's these beautiful moments in that documentation where sort of people are seated and you, know, you see like hands crinkling leaves and sort of ministering these very, these small, sound experiences and when you speak about practices of care that feels like very resonant with that project as well mm, queer magic intervention is a very very special yeah. uh, dear project to me mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. i'm still having like goosebumps i mean it was uh, it happened two years ago and we were invited to take over the the, the congress hall of the former um, former um, party Nazi rally grounds. It was it's in Nuremberg in Germany. It's mm -hmm. a gigantic area which was designed by Albrecht Speer, the the architect of the Third Reich and Hitler's architect. So uh, they they created some unbelievably you know like a giant um, structure uh, for the for the Nazis. And there is a, the Congress Hall. It's un, it's unfinished. It's a gigantic ruin. It looks mm -hmm. like a mm -hmm. Rome Colosseum on steroids. And um, and we are invited to take over this space and to bring our queer energy mm -hmm. to that space mm -hmm. to you know to revert through through witchcraft through magic mm -hmm. because there were mm -hmm. there are artists who work with this uh, to 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 change the you know the, the energetic pattern of this mm -hmm. extremely mm -hmm. dark and evil space. And um, one of the main assumptions of uh, Sprer's architecture, the, the Third uh, Reich's mm -hmm. architecture ideas, were it was supposed to be so gigantic that you, as an individual, you were supposed to dissolve mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in mass to create the power mass of the Third Reich, right? There was mm -hmm. no place for you, for your individual feelings, for your individual thoughts. You were supposed to completely dissolve mm -hmm. into, the, into the mass power. Of, uh, of 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 uh, Nazism, and um, so I wanted to reclaim yeah. your individual mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of this Colosseum on steroids, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we 
we put three chairs and I made a piece called Microspells. And it's a, it's a piece that is played directly to your ears with very tiny objects, mm -hmm. right? As tiny as possible, like dried leaves, music boxes. Um, uh, we, are, we are also using actually like uh, small vibrators. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, tiny bells, like, you know, like mm -hmm. really cute, cute things. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and we, we, we approach the listener from the other side and we, and we play those like very, very gentle things. And you're sitting and you're looking at this like unfinished, you know, completely fucked up idea, mm -hmm. you know, f mm -hmm. uh, that, that luckily didn't uh, take place, to reclaim mm -hmm. your personal experience. Because such evil and darkness can only be conquered with care and tenderness yeah. and Beautiful. gentleness, right? So, yeah. so this is, this is how, how it works in queer magic mm -hmm. uh, intervention. This part was just, uh, Microspace was only a mm -hmm. part of the whole show. It was a collaborative project uh, with, with uh, non-binary people, with trans people, with people, people of color. Mm -hmm. So it was also very important to bring this energy to, to, um, to that space and to mm -hmm. dance together on Hitler's grave. Yeah. I'm so glad we got a chance to speak about that project. The video documentation is incredible. Please watch it. It's just, it's just breathtaking. Um, I think at this point, maybe we'll take about 10 minutes to open up for comments and questions from the audience. I will walk the microphone over to you. So um, send a signal if you, if you uh, would like to share a question. I was, I hesitated a moment because I'm still fully forming my question, but one thing I wanted to ask you about is, um, what are your ideas about how much different mediums, you know, like, or <clears throat> cultures or environments, like, you know, graves or, or experimental, experimental operas in the park, or <clears throat> your most recent project, what they, the different ways in which they demand people, they, they, they demand, effort or interpretive effort from the audience. Like, like in the rave context, I think about, you know, as a member of the audience, you're given great freedom because it's just like, there's music there and you can go dance if you want. If you get tired, you can go talk to your friends and like mill about and, and whatnot. Whereas um, in different experiences or <laughs> other, other environments, kind of expect you to be there or be present or kind of, you know, assault you with sound or ideas for like four hours. And then your mind starts wandering, like ah, oh, this cherry, like like you talk, like you uh, talked about. So, I, I guess I don't have a fully formed question, but I was wondering if you have any more thoughts on that. Especially the losing concentration. I uh, once again, if you're coming tonight, I don't want to give you uh, spoilers, but. I was trying to find a method to uh, to deal with those issues, right? Even in a because in body opera, you know, you still you have to stay on the mat for an hour and, and thirty minutes, right? You don't have freedom to walk because that would uh, that would kill the the the, the thing. But we are offering you something else instead. In, in the in the big version of body opera, for example, after the lullaby, after the the the, the, the nap, um, the audience was um, participating in a warm up. Like very gentle warm up, I invited a a, a specialist who does um, resonance technique. It's a German technique. Uh, it's a mixture of Alexander technique and like stretching, tapping, which was uh, created in the eighties for musicians actually, to so they can uh, properly relax their bodies to have more resonance in their instruments. Right. So first you take a nap, then you then you stretch your body. You prepare like step by step your body for the for the for the for the experience. Then you do something else that I'm not going to tell, and then, uh, then you there is a mantra that you have to sing as well. So, so that was kind of fun, you know, to find those uh, those ways. <clears throat> and it's always, you know, when you when you do this type of work, there is a lot of like psychology of the of the crowd and psychology of, of the audience, and you have to consider all possible options, including always the darkest scenarios that can happen, you know, and you have to be kind of like ready for them. Uh, that people will go exactly in the wrong direction where, when you want them to go. That they will uh, trip on something, you know. That they will they will keep talking, which is uh, so. Um, for example, when I was doing this piece with the orchestra, <coughs> we uh, I had a I had a talk before the before the show, and I told people that if we ask you to walk in a slow motion for one hour, you know, around the foyer. It's a, it's an amazing building, like brand new venue. 
with open spaces on three le levels. Uh, we, we ask you to walk, but s specifically we, we kindly ask you not to speak because this space is very resonant. And even if you whisper, we can hear those sounds. We ask people to take their shoes off. Everybody got a pair of uh, socks. Uh, so it was also the kind of like this museum. You know, it, back in the day, in the museum, you would have to put those like funny slippers. Uh, so, so we just asked people to take. And uh, you know, they were like very formal people. They came to the to the symphony, and they were so happy to take their shoes off, and just to walk barefoot. You know, uh, for one hour, and you know, and also like, to give some guidance. Right? Please follow. Once again, Paulina Oliveros' uh, idea that um, sound is the map, walking is listening. Walk like you would have, you know, your ears on the uh, the soles of your of your of your feet. Walk as slowly as possible. And if you want to talk, please just leave the building for five minutes. You know, talk, say what you have to say, and then come back to us. Like this is our deal. And people were wonderful. And and Polish audience is not always so. <laughs> Obeying, you know, uh, rules. German audience is the is the worst because uh, you know when you can move, they already think that they're in the club and they can smoke, talk, and uh, and drink beer. <laughs> <clears throat> or they're very like snobbish. They think they've seen everything, so they can be totally disrespectful and uh, and and talk. So it, it it depends also on the on the country where you sometimes where you where you present your work. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers. Yeah, that's great. We'll do, we'll do one, two. Um, I, might, Sonia, okay. I might have the same issue as well, where like I was trying to formulate this question and I was like, does this even make sense? But, um, and you might have touched on it and I just missed it, but I'm curious because you're talking about um, kind of like these very spiritual practices entering the performance. And um, I'm curious, how you consider like if you're actually just kind of innately giving people these spiritual experiences versus like um, like an immersive sound experience because you know, of course like the meditation and then all of the kind of like um, ritual I guess it's just something that kept coming up. It's an ongoing and a very difficult and very important question. Uh, I mean, uh, I would never refer to my work as a ritual uh, because I think, you know, the, the ritual is to, uh, I, I wish, but, you know, I just, I don't know, it wouldn't be right to, to claim that, you know, my work, if it works for someone like that, then it's fine. And also, I never make my work with an intention of being spiritual. If it works for you, I work with sound, you know. And, but if it works uh, uh, for you this way, then I'm glad. I don't mind. Uh, it's welcome. And there was one more thing I was going to say, but now I forgot. Never mind. <laughs> but it was like a follow-up to your question, <laughs> something important. Mm, yeah. Ah, I know what. Like uh, sometimes, you know, you can get such uh, uh, um, surprising reactions from from the audience, right? Some people want more spiritual. Some people want, oh, I should have taken mushrooms. Uh, other people are, you know, uh, uh, you talk so much about liberating your body, and then you tell me to take my shoes off. I hate that. This is so oppressive. <laughs> And the point is, I never, I don't tell you to take your shoes off. I say you may take your shoes off, and this is the the subtle difference, right? Uh, so yeah. Is that all? It is. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about disability in your work and how you either address it directly or accommodate it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, in particular, mobile, mobility disabilities. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a big issue. Like, when I was doing transcription, for example, and the opera was happening on seven floors, we had special ushers who were taking care of, of people on wheelchairs. Or My mom, actually, she was using crotchets, and she was our testing um, uh, person. And uh, so, for example, in, in case of this opera, um, it, we had like special people trained and prepared. And they, they, uh, so people with different uh, disabilities, they had like a special trail uh, uh, adapted to, uh, to, to their needs. And they had like a designated special person to take care of them. Um, in terms of park opera, it was quite accessible because it was in the park, so you were able actually to, to, do, to do anything. In body opera, we do it this way that 
for example, in England, when we had an electric system failure and the space was so cold and really elderly people came and I felt so bad for them to lay down on a brick floor, you know, but they didn't, first of all, they didn't mind. But in this case, what we do, we, we offer a chair that we put a chair on the mat and then the person can just hold the pillow while sitting, sitting on the chair, right? But this is only for really for, for people who cannot lay down on the mat. This is because being on the mat gives you like the full, full, full experience, but, but it, it, is, it is accessible. Those works are accessible for people with different... Uh, I'm still wondering, uh, th this is also a very important uh, topic and Molly is such an inspiration also to, you know, to, to um, work on it and to, to be more aware of, uh, and more inclusive, right? It's to, to always make your work uh, accessible for different types of bodies and so on and so on. Um, I'm wondering, I have to, what, uh, what I was going to say for, uh, for a person with like uh, hearing impairment, like how this person would, would experience uh, body opera because in many moments this is actually, uh, you hear it like someone who has like some, uh, who might have some sort of like hearing loss. So, so I would love to know if this is fun for them or not. We maybe have time for like one more question. Please. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was happy to hear that you, you just started going to raves, and I'm wondering how, how you think of the interaction of raves and operas. It's a fun closing question. Yeah. <laughs> Are you coming tonight for the show? Yeah. Okay, so you will see. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. I mean, <laughs> as I said, like you know, I understand opera in a in a very specific in a very specific way. Yeah. But wait, do you mean like to play some fragments of the opera in the rave situation? This is what you mean? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, um, I guess I wouldn't mind if it was just like a short mm -hmm. quote. But you know, techno is techno. Like we don't have to uh, mess around. <laughs> Uh, uh, same way the other way, like, you know, composers trying to uh, compose like fake techno for orchestras. This is also not my cup of tea. So mm -hmm. let's keep these two words separate. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about the, you know, the music, it's about the, the setting and the environment to experience sound. So, for mm -hmm. example, as I said, I wouldn't yeah. mind to go to the opera and, and I wouldn't, I dance to Vivaldi at home, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I wouldn't mind to go to, to yeah. a concert with Vivaldi's music and I wouldn't, I wouldn't mm -hmm. mind to be able to dance to this music. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's like a perfect conclusion, I think. Thinking of sound as vibration and, and the movement of bodies and like that in a social framework, a framework of care. What a perfect way to end the conversation. Thank you so much, Wojtek. This has been fantastic. Thank you all for coming and for such wonderful questions. And we will see you this evening, hopefully. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I have to, I have to, I have to say something. I want to thank you to Annie, who single, almost like, not only how generous she is, but I want you, I want you to be aware that she basically she built the the whole setup mm -hmm. uh, from scratch for Body Opera with with uh, with the help of her wonderful students. But basically, it was her. She's yeah. she's fucking amazing, really.